afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jennifer Gray. I'm the Public Services Coordinator for FSCJ Library and Learning Commons, and I'd like to welcome you this afternoon to the Battle for America, how the fight for Fort Caroline shaped the United States. Before we get started, just a little bit of housekeeping. You are on mute. You will stay that way throughout the entire presentation for the convenience of our speaker. I've also got your cameras turned off just to make it a little bit easier for everybody to see the slides in case they don't know how to manage their screens too well. We will be taking questions at the end. If you have any during the presentation, just go ahead and put them in the chat. We'll get to them at the end. I promise we won't ignore you. And I think that is all of my business. So let me go ahead to get to the introduction for this event. All right. In September 1565, a group of Spaniards led by Pedro Menendez de Viles marched north from St. Augustine during a hurricane to surprise the French settlement at Fort Caroline. Caught sleeping and weakened by months of privation, all but a few of the French were killed, and the balance of power in the New World swung suddenly to the Spanish. Here today to discuss the climactic battle, as well as the long power struggle that led up to it and what the results meant for the, what would eventually be the United States, is Dr. Wesley Moody, professor of history at FSCJ and author of a forthcoming book on the subject. Professor Moody. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, very nice introduction. Uh, I made kind of a big claim uh, in the title uh, and I have less than an hour to back that up. So let me get going. Uh, and that claim of course is that the Little known battle of Fort Caroline in 1565 drastically changed U.S. history, uh, changed the shape of the United States. So, to make that argument, uh, I need to do three things. Uh, give the context uh, of what's going on in the world here in 1561 when this all starts. I need to tell the very fascinating story of the Battle of Fort Caroline and then explain its importance, although probably mix those together as much as possible. And of course, uh, open things up to questions uh, at, at the very end. So to start uh, our context, in 1561, uh, oops, not moving forward here. Um, there we go. Uh, in 1561, uh, Spain has the Western hemisphere to itself. Uh, and it is the richest, most powerful nation on earth the largest empire uh, the world has ever known, uh, controlling most of North America, most of South America, ha more than half of Europe. I mean, see the map there. Uh, and the money from Central and South America is I mean, flowing into Spain uh, in the tune of millions and millions of dollars here. Florida, however, uh, the Southeastern United States remains empty. Uh, empty of Europeans, at least. Spanish attempts to settle Florida have ended in massive disasters uh, from Ponce de Leon in 1519 until Tristan de Luna's failed settlement in Pensacola in 1559. Uh, Florida was a Spanish graveyard, it was called at the time. Now, other European countries are beginning to realize as Spain grows richer, uh, more powerful, that in order to survive, they need to get involved uh, in world, uh, world exploration. Now, the French are gonna come first and in the 15, 1550s, uh, 1560s, uh, Admiral Gaspard de Calonet, uh, it's him on, on the left of your screen, uh, he is the advisor to King Charles the uh, who is only 12 years old uh, here in 1561. Uh, there's uh, the picture on the right is uh, he is the one in the center. His mother's got his uh, got his hands on him, and there's his uh, uh, younger siblings. Um, and Colonay is advising the king, king's mother. Uh, we need to get involved in world exploration. Uh, Spanish have made a fortune. If we're gonna keep up with the Spanish, uh, we need to get involved. Now, Colonay's involvement is gonna lead to one of the great misconceptions of, of this entire episode. Uh, there's gonna be this belief that follows that Fort Caroline was a, a settlement with, with religious goals, uh, that this is the, you know, the Plymouth colony of religious freedom 70 years uh, before that happens. Uh, we'll come back to that, uh, but it's not accurate. Uh, Colonnais' goals are to increase the power 
and the wealth of France. But I said, let me come back uh, to the religious issue. Now, Spain has kept their knowledge of, of their possessions, what they know about the geography over here, uh, top secret. Uh, the French, the English, uh, the other European nations uh, know next to nothing uh, about the New World. What they do know is that the Spanish come over here, the Spanish have settled, and the Spanish have come back with uh, millions and millions of dollars worth of gold uh, each year. So, Colony believes that the mineral wealth the Spanish found in Central and South America would be common throughout the Western Hemisphere. Uh, any place we settle, that gold, uh, that wealth is going to be there. Now, Colony had initially attempted a colony in Brazil. Uh, it fails miserably, uh, and uh, the Portuguese will drive him out of Brazil. That's a that's a story on its own. Um, his second attempt is going to be a little further north. And this attempt is, is commanded by Jean Ribot. Uh, Jean Ribot is a professional naval man, uh, an ardent Calvinist, uh, a hardcore Protestant. And he's from a profession from a region of the country that's, that's dominated uh, by Protestants. On April 30th, uh, 1562, uh, his three ships uh, arrived at the St. John's River uh, with 150 people. Uh, so, command, we have Jean Ribot. This is meant as an exploring expedition. He is looking for a place to settle. Uh, and we'll find the place. We'll leave men behind as kind of placeholders. And then come back with men, supplies, uh, everything you need uh, for a colony. He names the St. John's River the River of May because uh, we land here early, uh, very early May. Uh, he leaves a marker uh, claiming the area for France, and then he goes north uh, to what what is today South Carolina, uh, and Ribot will decide that. Uh, the Port Royal area uh, of South Carolina is is the best place for a French settlement. Uh, so for uh, us, those those of us living here in Jacksonville, kind of a of an insult uh, from Jean Ribot here. Now, Port Royal, uh, I will give it its due. It is the uh, the largest natural port in the American South, the deepest natural port in the American South. So um, maybe maybe he had a claim there. Um, now, he builds at, uh, builds a small fort up there at Port Royal. Uh, the fort is actually where, uh, Paris Island, uh, where the Marine recruit training base is, uh, today. Uh, leaves 28 men there to, um, to hold the spot and will return to France to get reinforcements, supplies, uh, and all of this. Now, the reason uh, he's not happy with the with the Jacksonville area, uh, he's not happy with the with the River of May, is of course, uh, here we are our ships. I'm cutting off all my things here. Um, the river is extremely narrow or shallow. Uh, it's not good for uh, you know the big ships coming and going. Uh, we'll make a poor port. Uh, he also sees Jacksonville as a large native population uh, in Jacksonville and on the River of May. So even though they're very ex extremely friendly here uh, to Rebo in 1561, that could change. You know, we're always nicer to visitors than people that uh, are moving in here uh, permanently. So he's decided to, you know, to go northward uh, to permanent settlement. Now. The, the South Carolina settlement, uh, our um, Charles Fort settlement, uh, is, is going to end poorly. The men mutiny, uh, they kill their leader, uh, they build a boat uh, in an attempt to return to France. Uh, they barely make it back. Uh, and when they do make it back, 
their heart half starved. Uh, the boat is barely afloat when it arrives, and they they turn to cannibalism on the uh, on the return voyage. So, pretty much everything that could have possibly gone wrong uh, goes wrong uh, at, at Charles Fort. But they did have a great port there. Um, why the men mutinied? Um, all we have is is their word for it. They're the only survivors. Uh, but you read between the lines and. And it sounds like boredom uh, as much as anything else to do anything else. There's nothing to do in South Carolina. Um, not much now, definitely nothing uh, in 1561. Now, when the Spanish heard rumors of Charles Fort, uh, its existence, uh, they sent a small force to destroy the colony. When they arrived, they, found, they find it abandoned. Uh, they destroy what was left of the little wooden fort and they did such a good job of destroying the fort that it wasn't until the mid 1970s that archaeologists found evidence of it, uh, found the remains of Charles Fort. Uh, the picture in the top left hand corner is uh, all that's left of Charles Fort. Uh, if you're a, it's actually on the golf course of uh, at, at the Paris Island base. You have to uh, play around uh, if you're a uh, put around if you're a if you're a golfer. Now, when Ribot returns to France with the idea of once again resupply, reinforcements, putting together uh, a permanent colony, uh, he found that well, France is in the middle of a religious civil war. Uh, the Protestants have risen up to overthrow the Catholic king. Uh, fighting for religious right here, uh, as religious wars tend to be, uh, this is this is a bit of a mess. And Colony, in the meantime, since the launching of the expedition to Brazil, has converted to the Huguenot faith, uh, the Protestant faith, and he is the leader of the, the Protestant side uh, of this religious civil war, and. Not really in a good position here at a moment to send men to South Carolina to to help this colony survive. Not a good situation to be his right hand man either. Uh, if if you're Rebo, so Rebo is going to leave France uh, and he's going to travel to England, and in going to England, he is going to try to win support in England for for his colony. Uh, to get money, to get manpower, uh, and to make a return to America or to his American colony. Now, as a way to fundraise, he writes and publishes a, a narrative of his trip. Uh, he's got right hand corner there is uh, the title page uh, of his relatively short 10 page uh, you know, story of the, the discovery of, of Terra Florida. Um, it is the first English language description of the New World. Uh, he wrote it in English. He was writing for for an English market. Uh, still in print. Of course, uh, our good FSCJ library has got a copy. If you'd like to read the first, um, like I said, English language description uh, of New World. While in England, uh, he meets with Queen Elizabeth I uh, and her advisors, uh, sells them on the idea of New World Colony, uh, gets royal backing on two conditions, though. Uh, one is that the colony would be English, uh, that this would be an English flag flying over Charles Fort. And the second one, is that he gets an English partner and his English partner is going to be her illegitimate half brother, uh, Thomas Stuckley. Now, Thomas Stuckley, as it turns out, uh, is a huge con man, uh, ends up stealing the money, uh, stealing the ships for the expedition and uses them to commit piracy uh, in the English Channel. And Rebo escapes back to France. But the seeds of new exploration, uh, the seeds of English colonization in America has possibly been planted here with the Queen. 
uh, and it is Queen Elizabeth the first uh, who is going to charter the first colonies, uh, first English colonies in the New World. So Ribot, probably unattended, uh, has launched uh, French competition uh, in the New World. Now, when he returns to France, uh, the first war of religion has ended an uneasy truce. Colonnay has been pardoned, he has been forgiven, and he's resumed his position as admiral and advisor, uh, as advisor to the king. And he begins organizing a, a second expedition to North America. Now, as he's organizing, Ribo is still not back in France. He hasn't been able to meet up with, um, with Ribo yet. Uh, so he needs to find a second leader, uh, a new leader for this second expedition. The man he chooses is René Lunaire, and he had been on Ribot's first expedition. Uh, so he's an experienced hand, he's been to the New World, and he has three ships, uh, 300 men uh, to make a settlement, uh, and, and four women. He lands on the St. John's River, June 22nd, uh, 1564. And the reasons that Ribot had decided that the River of May, the St. John's region is a bad place for, for settlement. Uh, the flip side of the coin, uh, Lunaire decides those reasons are why it's a good place uh, to settle. Um, one, um, well, there's a large number of natives. Uh, Ribo was afraid they might turn against us. Uh, Ludenaire saw it as it's a large number of allies. Uh, it's a large number of, uh, of trading partners, potential trading partners here. And if you look at an area, if it supports a lot of people, then you know, supports a lot of people. Uh, that's a good reason uh, to settle there. Uh, also, it's a shallow river. Uh, it's hard to bring big ships in. I mean, Port Royal is the exact opposite. But Lunaire's way of looking is that keeps enemy fleets out. Uh, if it's the French fleet has a hard time getting in, then so does the Spanish fleet uh, having a hard time uh, getting in. So decides to build a settlement. Uh, the Relations with the natives have, have remained good. Uh, the picture in, in the top right hand corner uh, is a drawing of Ludenaire uh, meeting with the local king and showing them that they have, you know, uh, are, are honoring the place marker uh, that Jean Ribot had left uh, four years earlier. So he picks out a spot uh, about five miles inland from the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, we name it. Uh, Fort Caroline, uh, in honor of our uh, King Charles, uh, who's only about 16 years old uh, at this point, uh, only aged a bit uh, by this point. Um, it's a well-built um, fortress here, a uh, combination of pine logs, dirt, uh, will hold up pretty well against an attack. Uh, Two artist renditions here of the four, both drawn by somebody that had probably uh, never been to Florida. Um, the one on the left, it's kind of um, a little bit of a close up, but if you look at the the big picture, the the full full drawing, uh, you can see the the beautiful Florida mountains in the background. So obviously, somebody had never been to Florida uh, drew that. Um, palm thatch buildings. Uh, they learned really quickly that best to only build one story when you know, the hurricane winds come through. Um, built near the St. John's Bluff, uh, if you're familiar with the area, uh, the fort today is probably at the bottom of the St. John's River as the river has shifted and been dredged and that type of thing. But uh, we know it was relatively close to uh, St. John's Bluff and where the um, the National Park is uh, today. Now, initially, uh, Ludenaire is going to have good relations uh, with the natives. 
the natives are extremely friendly uh, as they've been uh, with Rebo, um, fed them throughout the summer and the fall uh, in exchange of French trade goods. Uh, these are, are the Timaqua, and as I said, initially, uh, French Timaqua relations are are very positive. Uh, Lundner, he's going to mess this up uh, really quickly, uh, really mismanage uh, Timaqua uh, French relations. Uh, there's a war going on uh, when he arrives uh, between the Timaqua, who lived in the Jacksonville area under a King Satarawea, and those who live down in the Interlochen area. Uh, if you're not familiar with the Jacksonville area, that's uh, about 60 miles to the south of here, a uh, king by the name of Otina. And Sadaria, French first arrive, wants an alliance uh, against his enemy. Ludner says, no, reasonably, no, we want to be everybody's friend. Uh, he then, however, allies with the enemy, uh, Otina, against other enemies. And he kind of gets tricked into it uh, a little bit. Uh, but basically ends up, Ludenaire makes enemies with everybody here uh, in, in the Jacksonville area. Now, the Timaqua lifestyle, we farm, uh, we grow squash, we grow other things that are here, and so, you know, bringing in the crops in that top left-hand picture, and they live on those until the crops run out, and they're generous with trading with the French until the crops run out. When the crops run out, the barn is empty, they go into the woods. Uh, the, the communities scatter, we go into the, you know, as you, it's all rural area, but, but less rural, more rural area at this point. And they live off the land. Uh, they hunt, they gather, and it's just, it's what we do. It's no big deal. Uh, the French, however, find themselves having been dependent on the Timaqua for food, Winter comes, there's no more food, you got to gather what you can get. Uh, they're in a pretty bad situation. Uh, they don't, you can't feed the French as well. Uh, they will trade with the French, uh, what little is left, but obviously, you know, laws of supply and demand, uh, the prices become outrageous. Um, and the team of never quite understand, you know, why don't the French, um, do so for themselves. Uh, why don't the French go out and fish? Why don't the French go out and, and pick off the berries? Uh, it's kind of a European medieval mindset. Uh, peasants gather food. Uh, we're the fighting class. Uh, we don't do that. Um, bad idea. Um, colony starving. Uh, at one point, they kidnap King Otina uh, in order to force his people to, to feed them, blackmail. Um, I mean, that's definitely uh, when, when relations hit rock bottom. Things continuing to get worse for the French. Uh, small group disappear. Uh, they desert. Uh, they steal one of the two, one of the colonies, two small boats. And they go south. Uh, they go to Cuba uh, to begin privateering, uh, to get, begin preying on, uh, you know, Cuban fishing villages and, and Cuban shipments. Uh, they're unsuccessful, they're captured, uh, they'll be sent to you know, the, the prison galleys in the Mediterranean. Uh, but more importantly, they talk, and the Spanish know the French are in Florida. Uh, so if you're looting there, colony starving, uh, the Spanish know we're here, and more importantly, once you've had guys go down and go pirate in the Caribbean, there's nothing you're gonna be able to say to the Spanish to convince them that you're not a nest of pirates up here in Jacksonville. So we're a small starving colony and the Spanish are on their way. So at this point, looting there with pressure from his men, we're gonna give up the colony, uh, dismantle the fort, build a new ship, and, and recross the Atlantic uh, and hope we can get back before, before we all starve to death. 
So they begin building a ship to return. Now, column A is sending a, a new expedition. Uh, column A is sending Rebo uh, with supplies and reinforcements. Uh, Ludenair has not been forgotten. The colony has not been forgotten. Uh, there's also, at the same time, a Spanish expedition uh, on the way. And that Spanish expedition is under the command of Pedro Menendez uh, de Aveas. Uh, there's Pedro Menendez on the left and his king, Philip II, uh, on the right. Now, Menendez... Um, was an experienced commander uh, for the Spanish. Uh, he had fought in Europe. He fought in the New World. Uh, he's the man who organizes Spain's uh, convoy system uh, that's bringing back these uh, um, massive amounts of gold. Um, and when the Spanish learned about the, the failed Charles Fort expedition, they made the decision that we need to settle in Florida. We need a permanent settlement in Florida uh, to make sure you no know, foreigners uh, settle. Because they saw it, the big danger, if you allow the French in Florida, if you allow the English, and anybody else in Florida, that's a threat to these treasure convoys. Uh, and just to somewhat put these treasure convoys uh, in, in perspective, uh, the Spanish have sent two convoys a year uh, sailing from Havana uh, back to uh, back to Spain. So two convoys a year. This is going on for, you know, the money starts dropping off probably about a, a hundred years. Uh, we're talking about, you know, convoys of, of 50 to 100 ships. Well, one of those ships they found in the 1970s, uh, the victim of a shipwreck. And the the Tampa wrecking crew that found it, and the Spanish government are still fighting in court over this. But this one shipwreck, one ship out of a convoy that goes twice a year, the gold on board is worth five hundred million dollars. Uh, so we're talking a good deal of money here uh, that we're looking uh, at, to protect. Now, when Menendez starts organizing his expedition. The assumption is Florida is, is once again uh, empty. Uh, the idea is going to be an expedition of a thousand settlers, uh, farmers, craftsmen, you name it, uh, bringing it along uh, nearly a thousand heads of livestock, cattle, sheep, uh, pigs. And he's looking at settling the Chesapeake Bay area. Uh, his sights are on, well, what will be the future uh, Jamestown uh, settlements. When he learns about Fort Caroline, uh, when reports come back from the New World about Fort Caroline, um, we'd captured those mutineers by this point, then the whole thing's gonna take on more of a military um, aspect. Uh, along with the mission of building settlements, uh, of converting the natives, is added the task of driving out the French and 500 soldiers are, are added to his fleet. Now, as Rebo is putting together his relief fleet uh, of settlers, of food, and all of that, uh, French spies bring him the information that there's a Spanish fleet on the way, uh, and it is a, a fleet of fleet of soldiers here, and so both. We're in a bit of a race here uh, who can get this thing organized first, and it's not an easy thing to pull together. Uh, and both sides know that there's an advantage in getting here first. Uh, there's a serious military advantage of, of getting here first. If you're Menendez and you can get to Fort Caroline before it has a chance of being reinforced, and it's your 500 men versus a starving colony, they don't stand a chance. Obviously, um, Rebo has it uh, the other way around. Now, as it turns out, Rebo is going to win by by less than 24 hours. Um, a little bit of luck is on his side. 
Uh, Menendez's fleet is hit by a major storm at sea. Uh, it is scattered. Uh, only three ships end up making it to Florida with about 600 men. Uh, the rest are scattered and ended up in other places in the Caribbean. Some to show up later, some uh, to settle elsewhere uh, and never show up. Luckily for Menendez, uh, of the 600 men that make it to Florida, 500 of them were the soldiers. Uh, so he kept those men close. So he is going to be able to carry out his first mission, which is to strike the strike the French. Uh, he arrives. We think uh, near Cape Canaveral, uh, June of 1565, uh, sails north, uh, reaches what is today St. Augustine uh, on the feast day of St. Augustine, so uh, hence the name. He sets up a small base camp uh, at St. Augustine and then takes his fleet, some of his fleet, north to figure out the situation, uh, access the situation, uh, hoping to launch an attack before Rebo gets there uh, with his reinforcements. He discovers, of course, Rebo is already there. Uh, most of his seven ships were in the river. They were strengthening the defenses of Fort Caroline at this point. Ludenaire had been taking the fort apart uh, when Rebo had arrived and, and superseded him uh, in command. Now, when Rebo learned the Spanish were in the area, uh, he decided to best strategies to attack, to find their camp and attack. Uh, Ludenaire warned him against this, uh, warned him about hurricanes. He'd already spent a couple of years here in Florida and knew a little something uh, about the weather. Uh, Menendez, in learning of the French arrival, predicting what their strategy was going to be, that he was going to be attacked, uh, rushes back to St. Augustine and begins preparing his defenses, uh, begins preparing a small wooden fort, uh, digging trenches, ready to put up a fight, to drive off the French attack. September 8th, uh, 1565, when all the ships were unloaded, but we're still, of course, building the fort and that type of thing, uh, they hold an impressive ceremony. Uh, that includes a Catholic mass, uh, officially claiming the land is for Spain. Uh, everybody takes their oath to Pedro Menendez as the governor of Florida. And then we have a feast. Uh, and part of the feast is in Thanksgiving that we survived and we made it here. Uh, part of the feast is also to invite the locals in, uh, invite the Timaqua in and um, have good relations here. Uh, so, arguably, uh, the first Thanksgiving uh, is happening here in St. Augustine, uh, where most of your pilgrims were even born. Um, now, Rebo, with 600 men, uh, tries to attack St. Augustine, uh, arrives at the entrance to the, to the river there at St. Augustine on September 10th. Uh, there's a sandbar. Uh, across the entrance. Uh, so he couldn't come in until the tide rose and, you know, he can come across uh, the sandbar. Now, he's sitting there waiting, uh, waiting for high tide to come. Uh, the Spanish are in battle array on the, you know, future side of the, the Castilla, uh, waiting for them to come in. Perfect timing for the Spanish, uh, a hurricane blows up. Uh, hurricane or a Northwester, it's, it's, a, it's a debated point, but you, know, you live around here, Northwesters can be pretty bad as well. The um, Rebo's fleet uh, is blown south. Uh, obviously, you know, ship's captain, you wanna get away from land uh, when the bad storm blows up. Now, Menendez knows he's got a couple days here. Uh, it's gonna take time for the storm to blow itself out, and then it's gonna take time for Rebo to pull his fleet together. So he decides on pretty bold action here. He's gonna take 500 men, and we're gonna march north overland uh, in the middle of pretty bad storm here. I mean, it's either a hurricane or a northwester, 
Um, the land we're crossing anyway uh, is not the best stuff here. Uh, two day march uh, across swamp, uh, sometimes swimming. Uh, they're, they're a scattered mess uh, by the time they reach Fort Caroline, uh, obviously. Uh, one of the local Timaqua that uh, Boudinaire has, has angered over the last couple of years is happy to show uh, Menendez the way to get there. Now, when he arrives at Fort Caroline, uh, it's sun setting, if you could see it, uh, on the second day here. Uh, his force is is scattered. Uh, we're standing around in a swamp right there uh, near the St. John's River before Caroline's on the other side of the hill. His men, his officers try to convince him, go back. Uh, you know, we're, we're too disorganized. We're too scattered. Uh, we don't stand a chance. Uh, you can't launch a battle in this kind of situation. Uh, Menendez realizes this is his only shot. Uh, this is his best opportunity if he's going to win here. Uh, so he orders an attack, uh, and it's a disorganized mob sent across the way here. Uh, almost any type of organized resistance whatsoever on the French probably would have meant a French victory here. I mean, we are rolling the dice, uh, and um, Mendez gets lucky. Uh, he catches the uh, the French completely by surprise. Uh, bad timing uh, actually works in Menendez's favor. Uh, when you want to launch one of these kind of attacks, uh, just as the sun rising is the time to attack. And so that's when the French are watching most. Uh, he ends up coming about 10 minutes later. So the French are watchful for about 10 minutes. And well, obviously nobody's coming today. Everybody go back to bed and there your attack comes. Uh, we catch the French completely by surprise. Um, sure, I'm getting my numbers right. 138 Frenchmen are killed. Um, most in their pajamas. Uh, we got them caught by surprise here. Um, 50 women and children are taken prisoner, uh, about 60 escape into the swamps, uh, and eventually make it to the boats, uh, are unable to sail away. Uh, Luton there is one of the men that is able to escape, but, um, his reputation is forever ruined as the man who escaped in his pajamas, uh, when, when the Spanish came. Now, Menendez leaves about 300 men behind in the fort. Uh, we rename it San Mateo. Um, then it rushes back to St. Augustine, uh, still expecting the, um, the French to arrive, uh, to have reorganized themselves, and it's still this, the French arrive and attack St. Augustine. This could easily go um, a different direction, uh, another direction. Um, now, he arrives back in St. Augustine, uh, and the French don't come. Um, month goes by, no word from the French. Uh, finally, uh, about a month later, uh, word comes in that the French had been shipwrecked, uh, and that there's large numbers of Frenchmen walking north. Uh, along the uh, along the Florida beach. Now, Menendez sends a force to the south, uh, meets up with them. The, the French are uh, Matanzas Inlet, uh, and it's kind of a position where they're trapped. Uh, inlet in front of them, they can't cross. Uh, narrow beach behind, going back all the way to Cape Canaveral, and swamp and scrub to to your west, obviously, Atlantic Ocean uh, to the east. They surrender to the Spanish, and all but 10 are put to death. Uh, at this point, the French still outnumber the Spanish. And, you know, in the days before I mean, effective firearms, you know, prisoner of war situation could turn on you uh, very, very quickly. We leave a force here uh, to watch the area. And the next month, 
another big group of Frenchmen arrived, near, more than 300. Um, this time, Ribot uh, is with them. Ribot is, is the commander there. Once again, uh, the Spanish demand they surrender. 150, including Ribot, uh, surrender. Uh, 170 refuse uh, and march off to the south. Those who surrender, once again, are put to the put to death. Uh, mass grave there near um, Matanzas Inlet. Uh, now, when they reach Cape Canaveral, uh, they find a shipwreck, uh, one of their shipwrecks, and this actually shipwreck's very recently been rediscovered uh, by archaeologists. And using the remnants of the ship, they throw together. They begin throwing together um, a small fort preparing to defend themselves. When the Spanish arrive, they convince all but 20 uh, to surrender. They, they promise those that surrender will be treated as POWs, will be sent back to France um, you know, as, as prisoners. Uh, this is the promise that's kept. Uh, no more executions here. Uh, 20 refuse and march off uh, to the interior. Uh, we don't know what happens to them. Uh, they disappear. Uh, it's 2021. I'm, I'm starting to lose hope that they're going to ever show up. Uh, so we, we probably will never know. Um, now, the place where the French had been slaughtered, we call this, of course, Matanzas Inlet, uh, place of slaughter uh, in Spanish. So uh, a good name there. Now, Ribot and his men were mostly Protestants. Uh, men that are executed here are Protestants. Uh, Colonnais converts after he sends the first expedition. But what we do have here at Matanzas is a Catholic force executing uh, a lot of uh, a lot of Huguenots, uh, a lot of Lutherans, uh, as as the Spanish uh, would have called them. And their deaths are going to be used uh, in the upcoming religious wars in Europe as as anti-Catholic Protestants or anti-Catholic propaganda. Um, this is the beginning of what we call the Black Legend, uh, the evil Spanish, uh, and this justifies uh, all attacks uh, against the Spanish in the New World, and most importantly, uh, it justifies attacking Spanish shipments of gold. Uh, so this becomes the Fort Caroline is going to become mischaracterized as this haven for, for Protestant religious freedom. The evil Spanish destroy it, so we're justified uh, to do whatever we want uh, or can uh, to the Spanish. Uh, very little truth to it. I mean, the Spanish are rough characters, but so is everybody uh, in the 16th century. Uh, the drawing here, the painting here is the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre in France. Uh, Admiral Colonnet uh, will lose his life here uh, at the, uh, the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, a uh, anti-Protestant riot uh, in, in Paris. But, um, It'll be, the French have been driven out. Uh, it will be another uh, 50 years uh, before the French will settle in North America. Uh, when they do, uh, it's gonna be in Canada, uh, about as far away as you can get from the Spanish and still be in North America. Uh, now, obviously a French victory might've put the French uh, in the Southeast uh, and a, permanent successful French settlement uh, in what is today Jacksonville, most likely would have been, uh, it's not gonna drive the Spanish out of the Caribbean, but it would have been a block to English settlement uh, in, in what is today Virginia. Uh, so very likely a French victory here may or may not have had a huge effect on the Spanish, but it would have kept uh, the English uh, out, of, out of the, out of the United States. Uh, and I mean, as we know, picture I have up here, uh, 
the English are going to end up in Jamestown uh, in, in 1607. And very likely, uh, I mean, Rabot's time in England uh, did convince Queen Elizabeth uh, in, in the wisdom of, of settling the New World. Now, had it not been the French, um, had the big what if here, uh, if there had not been a Ludenaire expedition, uh, if Pedro Menendez had been coming just to put it put together a settlement, no military aspect of this, he would have settled in Virginia. Uh, he would have settled in the Chesapeake Bay. That was his original plan. The military aspect of it puts him in St. Augustine. Uh, and St. Augustine is where we stay, and St. Augustine barely hangs on uh, as a colony. Uh, it's never a huge success. Uh, had that not been the situation, had we been in Virginia, maybe we're talking about a successful Spanish Virginia. Uh, maybe we're talking about, you know, the tobacco money being Menendez's uh, instead of John Smith's. Uh, successful Spanish colony in Virginia. The French in Fort Caroline might have blocked the Spanish. We know the Spanish in Virginia. Uh, would have blocked uh, English settlement. And of course, as we know, uh, without American colonies, England does not become the world superpower uh, that she will become. So events here uh, in the city of Jacksonville uh, are truly gonna change uh, world events. Uh, and of course, without English colonies, no United States uh, that will arrive in Florida here, um, change of flags here in, in 1821. So, excuse me for being very brief, but uh, I was on the clock. Uh, let me open it up uh, to questions. Uh, Reguntas, uh, oddly enough, is questioned both Spanish and English, and Leque is uh, the Timaqua word for question, but uh, I will be unable to answer any of your questions in Timaqua, so let's just uh, stick to English if you don't mind. English. We do already have a question in the chat. If anybody else has questions, please do put them in the chat and we'll get to them. Uh, just to start off, we have a question. How were the French able to understand the language of the local Timuqua? Uh, and did the Timuqua have any strong feelings about the outcome of the French defeat and Spanish victory? What was the native uh, well, perspective? First of all, I'm not going to answer any questions from uh, Professor Conrath. Um, so, next question. Uh, uh, obviously, joking. Um, love you, Dan. The um, it, it takes time, uh, and I'm sure there's a lot of misunderstandings. There's a lot of finger pointing uh, and, and drawing in the sand, uh, but they do figure it out. Uh, Locals learn, uh, uh, the Frenchmen learn Timaqua, you have Frenchmen that pick up Spanish. Uh, it, it takes time. Uh, and you know, some people have the ability to learn language. Uh, I almost wonder if, you know, people back then um, were better at learning languages than we are. Uh, I mean, if you think about the fact, I mean, how many plots of television shows that you have running around in your brain, if that wasn't there, you know, how much better are you at learning language uh, than we are today? And what was the second part of the question? I'm sorry. The follow-up is, uh, did the local Timucua population have any strong feelings one way or the other about the outcome of the French defeat and the Spanish victory? Um, They learned not to like the French uh, during the um, during the French period, and, and it's one of those things. Uh, had Ludenaire kept good relations uh, with with the locals with the Timaqua, uh, that's a powerful ally. I mean, we're talking about thousands of warriors that could have been on the French side, um, but they've alienated uh, the Timaqua by this point, and so. The Timaqua probably prefer the Spanish. Uh, the Spanish haven't alienated them yet. Uh, that'll come over the next 50 years. 
So um, yeah, they're neutral in this. Uh, they stay out of it, and obviously that makes uh, all the difference in the world. anything else in the chat i'll go ahead and ask can you tell us just a little bit you've mentioned that menendez's force was largely by the time he arrived here you know those 500 soldiers can you tell us a little bit about the composition of the population of the fort caroline settlement with the french do we know anything about that um mostly uh these are guys from northern france uh and these are uh at least initially uh, we're talking about professional soldiers. Uh, we're talking about guys that, I mean, this is what they do. Uh, and that's, that's one of the problems. Uh, I mean, if you bring over farmers, uh, if you bring over laborers, uh, you know, maybe we're not talking about a starving colony, uh, but it's mostly uh, your warrior class they bring over. And once again, it's, it's peasants that collect food. But mostly Northern French, uh, Mostly from those areas, they're very, uh, very solidly Protestant. Just to kind of close us out, uh, if there people who attended the event want to do some reading to learn a little bit more about all of this, what are the resources that you would personally suggest to them to take a look at? Um, there are. Several first, good first hand accounts uh, that have been published by the Florida Historical Society. Uh, we have uh, Lunaire's uh, writes his uh, history of the event. Uh, we have a, a second in command under Menendez uh, who, who writes uh, about what had happened. UF Press uh, just put that out. Uh, secondary sources, probably the, the best written. Uh, is there's a book called uh, the, In the Eye of the Storm uh, by John McGrath. Uh, and he does a really good job telling both sides of the story. Um, a little more of a scholarly book, but it's uh, very well worth a look. Uh, they had an artist uh, that was with the, uh, with the French expedition. And there's debate about whether, you know, the engravings that... Uh, are included with his narrative were actually based on his paintings or those came later. Uh, but he does a pretty good job telling uh, the first hand account uh, of the story. To tag on to that, I will also recommend there is a fairly excellent book that came out in the last five or six years, I think, called Painter in a Savage Land, which is sort of nominally a biography of Jacques Lemoyne, the artist, and is more about the entire Fort Caroline experience. And that is it also really is a very good book. Thank you for mentioning that. I forgot that one. Great. All right. Well, thank you so much, Professor Moody, for joining us today. This has been fabulous. Uh, this event will, is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube account eventually. Uh, but I'd like to thank everyone who came out in attendance today and uh, give a round of applause for Professor Moody. Silent clap from the audience. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.